right, we're continuing in our long series of messages regarding uh, the seeds of the two trees in the garden and how they've carried forth throughout history. And last week um, we talked about Avraham's faith. And at the end of that, um, I told you guys that, that this week I would be giving a message on true faith. And this is actually a multi-part message on true faith, and so this is part one. And today is January the 8th, 2011. So, Happy New Year, everybody. And the third day of Shvat, 5771 on the Hebrew calendar. Now, one of the things that, um, you know, we need to talk about to begin with are some things that true faith is not. And I'm, it's not, I'm not going to go into real depth, but I'm just going to list some things, Okay. Because these are common misunderstandings in the body of what faith is. Faith is not a formula that can be learned by rote. Faith is not a feeling. Faith is not an intellectual assessment. Faith is not agreement with certain principles. Faith is not name it and claim it. Faith is not the repetitious quoting of Scripture. And I have been in different situations and encountered different people who have taught one or more of these things in my lifetime. True faith is seeing and knowing Yeshua, believing Him and trusting Him consistently and faithfully. And, you know, last week when we talked about Avraham, we talked about the fact that, um, that Yeshua said that Avraham had seen him. We talked about that the reason why Avraham was so quick and so willing to offer up his son was not just simply because he had a, an awesome relationship with God and he trusted God, but because he had had a vision of Yeshua's life, his death, and his resurrection. And he understood that when God asked him to give his own son, that his son was a foreshadowing of what he had seen in his vision of Yeshua. And so... Thus, the reason why Abraham has Yitzchak carry the wood is because Abraham had seen in his vision of Yeshua, Yeshua carrying his cross. And the reason why he could believe that if he offered his son, his son would be raised back from the dead, as it tells us in Hebrews, was because he had seen Yeshua die in a vision and be raised back from the dead. And so he understood that in order for the shadow that God was asking him to portray through the offering of his son, for it to be consistent with what he had seen in the vision, that if God actually required him to sacrifice his son, God would raise him back from the dead. Okay? So, Abraham saw... Yeshua. And here's the thing. It's not just believing the words of the Messiah. 
but believing in the Word Himself. I have personally known people that knew the words in this book better than I did. But from the fruit of their lives, from the other things that they believed, I was absolutely positive they didn't have a relationship with the God of this Bible. Okay? So it's not just believing the words, it's believing the Word. Knowing He is the very embodiment of the truth on which we can build our entire existence. Yeshua, when Yeshua said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, He wasn't just quoting some cliché for people to remember, a catchy phrase. He was making a statement about Himself that was true then and is true now and will always be true. He is truth. The spiritual laws that God established in the beginning are like our laws of physics here on the earth. Once they have been established, they are always they always function. Okay? So they work at all times for everyone who uses them. In fact, and here's something that you might not have ever contemplated before, the only way that Hasatan, the adversary, can do what he does, everything that he does is based upon the, the laws that God already created and set in motion. Have you ever thought about that? Satan didn't create the laws. And Satan can't override the laws. He has to work within the parameters of the laws that God already created. And so his very existence, his functioning, his ability to do anything is within the parameters of the laws that God has already established. And he knows those laws forward and backwards. He just bends them for his own purposes. Now here's the thing. This is where people, many people, get confused and don't have a clear understanding. Because these laws have been established by God from the beginning and they work everywhere all the time for anyone, it is possible for human beings to do grady, grady, <laughs> to do great mighty works that seem to be of God and for God and they work because they're based upon the laws that God established and they may not have a relationship with God. The prime example that I have used through the years, even here, is a particular teacher who is no longer welcome in Texas. He was run out of Texas. He's now in Florida. He started off here in Texas, up in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. They had a congregation called Word of Faith up there. Okay? You remember Ted Pierce, the guy that came here and did the concert? Ted Pierce, before he, you know, before he really became more famous and music is his livelihood, and he's done a lot of different things through his life. And one of the things that he did back before he was a believer was he used to work for a car dealership up in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. And he used to work with the guy that started the Word of Faith Church. What is his name? Robert yes, Robert Tilton. He used to work with Robert Tilton in this car dealership. And he used to hear Robert Tilton and a friend of his who ended up going into the ministry with him overheard them at lunch times and break times talking about what a great way it would be to make money to start this church. Okay? So the whole venture of starting the Word of Faith Church was to make money. That was it. 
And of course, that's the reason why he ended up getting run out of Texas was because he was bilking people of hundreds of thousands of dollars and he got caught. Okay. Now he's doing it out in Florida, doing the same thing. But I have known people who got saved under his quote-unquote ministry, who got healed, who had financial turnaround, who had all sorts of miraculous things happen because they went to his church. Okay? But the man was not of God. The reason that those things happened was because the principles of God, the laws of God, are established forever. They work all the time, everywhere, for everyone, no matter who employs them. And relationship with God is not a prerequisite for those things being able to happen. So you have to be very careful. That's the reason why the scripture warns us about false prophets coming to us with lying signs and wonders. Have you ever wondered about that? How can they do these things? And they, they be lying signs and wonders. They can do them because they're basing them upon the laws and the principles that God established. The warning to us about the false Messiah, the anti-Messiah that will come and his false prophet is that they will do lying signs and wonders such that even the elect, if it were possible, would be deceived. And what I'm telling you today is there's a way for you to understand where you don't have to be deceived. The key thing is you do not judge whether a person is of God or not by the miracles and wonders that they do. You judge them by the fruit of their life. What is the consistent fruit of that person's life? Uh, most of the, uh, the German church loved Hitler and was good for the country. Yeah. And for them. Yeah. Yeah, Richard was saying most of the people of Germany absolutely loved Hitler because he was good, you know, in the condition that they were in. They saw him as good for them and for their country. So miracles cannot be the plumb line for measuring someone. Here's, here's the fruit of counterfeit faith. Well, before I even go in, into that, I want to warn you. We have to be very, very careful not to do a particular thing. And that is to point at someone in particular and, and say, unless you've got proof like we had, like I was telling you about Robert Tilton, that's all documented, it's historical information, anybody can access that information, okay? But if you just suspect that somebody is not of God, you can't run around and, and point at that person and say, that person is not of God, that person is not of God, that person is not of God. Okay? That's not our it's not our job to do that. If a person if we know, if we have factual information about someone like we have about Robert Tilton, we can warn people, don't get mixed up with that person. That person will take your money. That person is a scam artist basically, a con. Okay? Because once I tell you, uh, make this statement, you may in your head begin going down a list and you may identify some people, but it's not your business to start shouting it at the, uh, from the rooftops. Okay? The fruit of counterfeit faith is pride. Okay? The fruit of counterfeit faith is pride. The fruit of true faith is love and humility. 
Now, I personally, the reason I know that you will have a list in your head is because I have a list in my head of people that I've seen, that I've experienced, I've watched on TV, etc., etc., that are well known for miracles. And when we know that the fruit of counterfeit faith is pride, I have a list in my head. Okay? Much of what is called faith today is merely the grasping of those who are still earthly minded masquerading as heavenly minded. I'm going to say that again. Much of what is called faith today is merely the grasping of those who are still earthly minded masquerading as heavenly minded. The fruit of this kind of teaching which, and what I'm talking about is the prosperity teaching. The fruit of this teaching will be an overemphasis on earthly blessings and acquiring of wealth. But I want us to take a look at some scriptures. We haven't done that yet. Let's take a look at Romans chapter 8. Verses 5 through 11. Romans 8, 5 through 11. Mm. For those who identify with their old nature set their minds on the things of the old nature. But those who identify with the Spirit, set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Having one's mind controlled by the old nature is death, but having one's mind controlled by the Spirit is life and shalom. For the mind controlled by the old nature is hostile to God, because it does not submit itself to God's Torah. Indeed, it cannot. Thus, those who identify with their old nature cannot please God. But you, you do not identify with your old nature, but with the Spirit, provided the Spirit of God is living inside you. For anyone who doesn't have the Spirit of the Messiah doesn't belong to Him. However, if the Messiah is in you, then on the one hand the body is dead because of sin, but on the other hand, the Spirit is giving life because God considers you righteous. And if the Spirit of the one who raised Yeshua from the dead is living in you, then the one who raised the Messiah Yeshua from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit living in you. Okay? So, it tells us that the people who are following the old nature, that their focus is going to be earthly things, temporal things, things of this existence. Okay? And then let's look over at 1 Timothy chapter 6. Verses 6 through 12. First Timothy six, six through twelve. Now this is the balanced approach. This is the quote unquote whole counsel of God in the scriptures. Verse six Now true religion does bring great riches, but only to those who are content with what they have. For we have brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. So if we have food and clothing, we will be satisfied with these. Furthermore, 
those whose goal is to be rich fall into temptation. They get trapped in many foolish and hurtful ambitions which plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all the evils. Because of this craving, some people have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves to the heart with many pains. But you, as a man of God, flee from these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faithfulness, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith Take hold of the, of the eternal life to which you were called when you were testified, when you testified so well to your faith before many witnesses. Okay? So in this passage it says, it basically tells us, don't go after the earthly riches. What you're supposed to be pursuing is godliness and righteousness, etc., etc. This accords with what Yeshua said. When, um, when he talked to his disciples about don't fret, don't concern yourself over where you're going to live, what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, etc., etc. He went on to say it's the heathen that focus their attention and go after these things. Instead, seek... God's kingdom and His righteousness and all of these things will be added to you. So, Yeshua says, you follow after me, you follow, you determine to spend your time focused on building the kingdom of God and I will take care of you. Okay? Being rich or poor in earthly th things has no bearing on our spirituality or degree of faith. There are those, and this is something that I've been dealing with with someone else, okay? There are two opposite extremes that, are, that have been prevalent in the body in, in teaching on this regards. One extreme says in order to be spiritual, and to show faith, you have to become totally impoverished. Okay? That's one extreme. The other extreme says, in order for you to show your faith and spirituality, you have to become wealthy. Okay? Those, neither one of those extremes is true. And it's not fair for a preacher or a teacher to stand up in front of people and say everybody in the body has to be one or the other. Okay? But that's what happens. There are preachers and teachers that teach those things. And they will tell you if you're not that way, if you're, you know, the impoverished thing was real prevalent years past. Okay? That's not so prevalent now. It's still around. The thing now, in the last 60 years, is the whole get wealthy thing. Okay? And the only, the only reason why that can even be taught and accepted in this country is because in the last 60 years we've become an affluent nation. If you go over to one of the African nations that, where the people don't have anything, the only people that have anything are the elite the governmental leaders or whatever, you can't stand up in front of a big group of people that live in some grass hut village out in the deserts of Africa and tell them that because they're not wealthy, they don't have enough faith. Or that they've got the spirit of poverty. So these teachings that are being taught today are not true and they're, they're, they only fly here in the United States or in other wealthy countries because that would be the only place that you'd actually be able to to do anything about it. 
So how much we have or how little we have has no bearing on our spirituality or degree of faith. And in fact, in many of those countries where they're suffering loss and lack, those people are more spiritual and have more faith than the people that live here in this country of what I like to call the country of more than enough. Okay? We're to be, when it comes to either being rich or to being poor, or somewhere in between, we're to be what Abba has willed us to be. He is the one who determines for us. Now, let me ask you a question. Is there a demonic spirit that can come on people that causes them to be bound up in poverty? Yes. There is such a spirit that comes on people. And no matter what they do, they're always going to be impoverished because of that bondage that is on them by a spiritual force of darkness. And when that is discerned, that needs to be broken off. Okay? But that's not the case for everybody that's poor. And the, the main thing just like everything else, I mean, this is, it always comes back to this. My teaching is always, always, always going to come to this. This whole issue has to do with our relationship with God. Our intimate, daily relationship with God. We have to go to God on a daily basis and ask Him, Today, God, what do you want for me? If today God says, I have somebody coming with a million dollars to give to you. You say, praise God. Okay, God, what's it for? What's it for? What do you want to use it for? If you've got somebody bringing me a million dollars, you have a reason for bringing that million dollars to me. And it's not for me. Okay? Or if God says, okay, today I want you to sell all your stuff. You're not going to have anything except the clothes on your back. And I want you to go do such and such. That is up to God to determine for us. This person that I have been dealing with has asked questions such as, Do you want to be poor? Well, if, if you ask anybody, Do you want to be poor? They're going to say, No, I don't want to be poor. My desires are not to be poor. Okay? The other question is, don't you want to have more money so that you can invest it in the kingdom of God? Of course I would love to have more money to invest in the kingdom of God. But those are not the right questions to be asking anybody. Not to ask yourself or someone else. The question is, God, what do you want me to have? And I'm content with whatever you want me to have. Okay? Philippians. Philippians chapter 4. Verses 11 and 12. Rav Shaul says, Not that I am saying this to call attention to any need of mine, since as far as I am concerned, I have learned to be content regardless of circumstances. I know what it is to be in want. And I know what it is to have more than enough. In everything and in every way, I have learned the secret of being full and being hungry, of having abundance and being in need, and of what is that secret? Being content with what God has given to you. Now I would ask this question, did Rav Shaul lack faith when he was hungry or when he suffered need? I don't think anybody, any of us would say that Rav Shaul didn't have enough faith. Okay? His contentment in his hunger 
and in his need was his faith. Okay? Now here's a statement that you need to make note of. Whether you write it down or you just infuse it in your head. Because there's not very many people who are going to tell you this. Promises of God are not so we can have and or do. The promises of God are not so we can have and or do. They are so we can be found in Him. That's the reason why He gives, fulfills the promises, is so that we can be found in Him. So our attention will be drawn to Him. He is the one who gives us these things. He is the one who has made the promises. He is the one who fulfills the promises. It's to turn our attention to Him and to be found in Him. And here's another thing. The promises are not made to us as individuals, but as the corporate body. The promises that God has given, He has given to the corporate body, not to us as individuals. The temptations that Hasatan brought against Yeshua in the wilderness, if you pay attention to each one of those, it was... It was an attempt on Hasatan's part to get Yeshua to meet his own needs. Every one of them. Instead of waiting and allowing his father to give him those things, which the father was already going to give them to him, intended to, it was, take it upon yourself. Fill your own stomach. Do, follow after me and you'll get all of the kingdoms of the world. Do it on your own. Okay? There's a... Um, Richard and Diane sent me a... Uh, something that was put on Facebook by a woman named Claudia Lovejoy that's a friend of theirs that I'm going to read here in a moment. But before I do that, um, the last, last point that I want to make before, before we close today is we don't perform great miracles by believing who we are in the Messiah but who He is in us. Okay? That's the reason why counterfeit faith leads to pride. Is because the, per the person who is employing counterfeit faith has believed, has come to believe that they are something special. Okay? But the only reason why God wants miracles to be done is so that He living in us can shine out through us into the world. Okay? So we don't perform great miracles by, by believing who we are in the Messiah, but who He is in us. In Yochanan, John chapter 14, verse 12, Yeshua, this is where Yeshua says, you're going to do the works that I've done and even greater because I go to my Father, which is in heaven. Why? Why was it significant that they would end up doing these things because He would go to His Father in heaven? It's because by Him He had told them already, when I go, then I will be able to send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. 
The presence of God will actually indwell you. God's presence will be in you. And so, God's presence in you will perform these great miracles and these signs and wonders. Not because of you, who you are, but because of who He is. Here's what Claudia writes. Check out the man standing numbly by the church coffee bar talking about his impending divorce. Listen to the voice of the Christian mother as she frantically asks people to pray for her teenage son who's just been arrested on drug charges. Then take a moment to watch the expressions on these same faces as they settle in for a sermon on how to become a better spouse, a better parent, a better you. What's wrong with this picture? Why are so many believers disheartened? You don't have to be a modern day prophet to hear all the unanswered questions burning in the minds of American believers. Many of us seem to be silently repeating the words from that old song, The Pretender by Jackson Brown. I don't know how many of you know that. That's from our era. The words are, I want to know what became of the change we waited for love to bring. Were, the, were they the, only the fitful dreams of some greater awakening? What about that change we waited for God's love to bring? What happened to the zeal we once knew as we reached out to grasp the pearl of great price? We felt incredible feelings, sang inspiring songs, listened to awesome testimonies, experienced spiritual revelation, and absolutely believed in miraculous intervention. Why then have so many of us lost our focus? Or could it be, like the Galatians, our focus has been misplaced? Would the Apostle Paul say to us, Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? That's Galatians 3.3. 3. I believe my answer would have to be yes. When I became a believer 27 years ago, I lived and moved and found my being in Yeshua. I believed in the rising of the sun, S-O-N, more than I believed in the coming of the dawn because my focus was the Messiah. But as the years went by, congregations split, plans failed, leaders stumbled, ministries tumbled, my heart grew cold, disappointment after disappointment, and I stopped focusing on the wounds of the Messiah and started tending to my own. This didn't happen overnight, but year after year, my reckless trust in the things of God began to diminish. Like so many in my generation, hope deferred made my heart sick. And so I began to protect myself, rely on myself, comfort myself, and medicate myself with food, fun, friends, and feelings. Having begun in the Spirit, I now chose to continue in the flesh. To put it bluntly, the lights in my darkened understanding began to flicker. But four years ago, I began to realize how much my focus had shifted to the things of earth rather than to the things above. Whereas my greatest desire had once been for Yeshua, it had gradually morphed into a desire to create a better planet upon which my better self could live. Instead of focusing on the captain of the host of the armies of heaven, I see now that I remade the Messiah into the host of Let's Make a Deal. Instead of reaching out for the keys of the kingdom of heaven, I wanted him to hand me the key to door number three, the one with abundant life written on it in big gold letters. I couldn't wait to open that door. 
because inside I was sure to find health, wealth, happiness, and the love I deserved. But I forgot one essential truth. Being a believer isn't about being healthy, wealthy, or happy. It's not even about finding true love. It's about following Yeshua. Remember the cross before me, the world behind me. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back. No turning back. So why did I want to turn back? Why do many of us want to turn back? Because when life on earth becomes our focus, the unending sorrow of human existence makes our hearts sick. C.S. Lewis commented on this very problem when he wrote, quote, aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither, end quote. I believe that in 2010, many believers have aimed at earth and come up empty. But this wasn't always the case. Until about a hundred years ago, human beings didn't need to be reminded to focus on eternity. Poverty, disease, war, famine, hardship, and trouble were the norm for most believers prior to the 20th century. You didn't need to tell a coal miner that heaven is a better place. You didn't have to remind an 18-year-old about to walk onto a battlefield that this world is not our home. A mother who loses three out of five children before they reach adulthood doesn't put all her hope in this brief existence. And a, ma a man trying to feed his family with a mule and 40 acres isn't mistaking a dirt farm for the promised land. But things have changed for most Americans. Human life is a more pleasant experience these days, complete with good food, comfortable churches, luxurious vacations, spacious homes, and endless entertainment. Who needs to focus on eternity when earth is so full of good things? As our lifestyles have become richer, our faith has become poorer. As we seek to satisfy our earthly desires, we have ceased to desire heaven. And consequently, we are offended when life doesn't treat us in the style to which we have become accustomed. Americans are surly when our lattes aren't hot enough. Angered when the car in front of us doesn't drive fast enough. Insulted when service isn't professional enough. Enraged when we aren't treated well enough. And self-pitying when faced with unexpected trials and tribulations. How far we have fallen from the words of Scripture which tell us to, quote, consider it all joy when you encounter various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, end quote. That's Yaakov or James chapter 1 verses 2 and 3. As for me and my house, I have decided to return to my first love and do the deeds I did at first. In 2011, my only goal and my strong desire is to move backwards to faith in the finished work of Yeshua and forward to maturity in the Messiah. And with that, I would like to pray. Abba, we have it so good in this country. And yet the least little things, the least inconveniences, the least little trials and tribulations that we experience cause us to kvetch, to gripe, complain, 
and to act as if we were in the most horrible misery that could ever be experienced. Father, forgive us. Forgive us for forgetting what our life is all about. Forgive us for leaving our first love. Forgive us for focusing on this realm and what it contains instead of on heaven. Instead of on looking to the city not built with hands. Instead of laying up treasures in heaven where neither rust nor moth corrupt and where thieves cannot break in and steal. Father, this is real to Deborah and I and to this congregation because over the last year we've had many things stolen. And Father, it's hard. It, it makes us angry when people do that. And it's not right. There's no doubt about that. It's not right. It's not just. The people who do that need to be punished. But Father, those were just, they were just things. Even if we spent a lot of money on them, and that money basically is down the drain, they were just things. Things that would eventually fall apart and go away anyway. And once we leave this life, we would not care less about those things. So Father, I pray. I pray for us here in this congregation. But I pray for your body at large, Lord God. that you will help us to get our focus back where it's supposed to be. Father, the body in this country wonders why we can't have the effect that we're, that we're supposed to have on the lost. The answers are right in front of our face, but we can't see them. Father, we need to have the scales removed from our spiritual eyes. We are indeed in this country as described in the church of Laodicea in the book of the Revelation. We are a group of people in this nation who believe that we have everything that we need. And yet, yet when you look at us, you say, no, you are poor, you are naked, you are blind. Father, we have strayed so far from where we're supposed to be. Return your body, Lord, back to you. Open our eyes so we can see the true condition of the body in America, Lord. So we can see where we truly are and we can see the path where we're supposed to be and get back there. Father, I pray that you will build in us, in this group of people, true faith. True faith. To see you and know you and to have relationship with you and to believe you even if we have to wait a lifetime and even if we go to our death never seeing the fulfillment of the promises just like we have the list in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews those people lived out their lives faithful to you never seeing the completion of the promises that you made to them how many people in this world in this country today live like that
But that's the definition of faith. Bring us back. And we shall come. Renew our days as of old. I pray this in the authority of Yeshua. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Yevarech Adonai v'yishmarecha Yair Adonai p'nav lecha v'yikunecha In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, our Lord, our righteousness, our salvation, the Prince of Peace. Amen.